Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 42, and you can find that in your New Testament pew Bibles on page 120. Acts chapter 2. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We are doing a four-part sermon series on the sacraments in the Presbyterian Church, and the Presbyterian Church recognizes two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Last week, I preached on baptism, and I kind of walked us through the Old Testament passages leading up to the New Testament and the covenant of baptism. And today, I am thrilled that your preacher is not me, but Dr. Craig Field, who is well known to many of us. Craig is a member of this church. He's an ordained elder in the Presbyterian Church. Um, he is a UTEP professor in the psychology department, and most recently, Craig completed his certificate in ministry through Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, uh, which will allow him to do things a lot like this and, and contribute his ministry here among us um, and lead worship and do other things. And so um, this is a great opportunity, and I was thrilled when Craig agreed to tag team preach with me this month. So we'll get to hear Craig today on baptism. And then I'll preach next week on the Lord's Supper, and then Craig will weigh in on the Lord's Supper again. Please welcome Dr. Craig Field. Thank you. Thank you. Is my mic working? Yes? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and it's good to see all of you. It really is uh, nice to see a group of people in a, a room together uh, to worship. Um, and come together and hear the word of God. And so when Neil invited me to talk about baptism, I gave him the warning that um, I was raised Southern Baptist. So to understand my perspective on baptism, you need to at least understand kind of where I'm coming from because in a lot of different ways, uh, we learn a lot about ourselves and our beliefs comparing those to other way that I've better understood uh, the practice of baptism and in particular infant baptism. And so that's the question that I really want to answer for us today is why do Presbyterians baptize infants? Um, and it's in our key verse today, for his promise is for you and for your children and for all who follow them, for everyone that, the God, call, that God calls to him. And so, as a Baptist, um, I was baptized when I was 16, which is, is very common. Um, it's always an adult baptism. We are credo-baptist, which means that uh, we baptize when someone accepts the faith, accepts Christ as their savior, uh, commits, uh, repents for their sins, and commits themselves to a life of discipleship. So it is decidedly an adult Process. It is something that is reserved for adults, and it's adults who proclaim um, Christ and proclaim repentance, re request repentance and baptism. And so it's, a, it's an act of, it's a profession of faith, and it's a public display of that faith, right? It's me coming forward and saying, I am like you, I believe in Christ, I am devoting my life to be like Christ, and I repent for my sins and will turn the other way, turn uh, toward a, a better life. And so seeing 
uh, infant baptism for the first time as a Presbyterian was a bit of a shock for me. And it really wasn't until I saw one that it occurred to me that this is very different than the faith that I grew up in. And why, why, would we, why are we doing this? Why would we baptize infants? It's not something I'm familiar with. Is it something from Roman Catholicism? Is it some hangover from that? What, what is it? What is the way to, to understand this practice within the Presbyterian faith? And as a good Baptist, a good Baptist will say, where in the New Testament does it say that I should baptize infants, that I should baptize children? And some news for you, it doesn't. It doesn't say it anywhere in the New Testament that you should baptize your infants. The closest that it comes, and we'll better understand this, is the verse that I'm focusing in on today. For his promise is for you and for your children and for all who come after them, for anyone who God has, has called to him. And our verse begins with for, for his promise. And the for suggests that it's connected to the verse before that. Um, it's related to the verse that comes before that verse and clarifies and builds upon that verse. And so what is the context of these two verses? The context of these two verses is within the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, what the disciples have done is gone out to fulfill the Great Commission. Christ, after his crucifixion, um, ascended into heaven, and before ascending into heaven, he gave his disciples the Great Commission. He said to them, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts, they are fulfilling that promise to Jesus. Go out and to tell everyone about him, about God, about God's grace and Jesus Christ's sacrifice his resurrection and his coming, his future coming. And it, these verses take place when Peter is doing, uh, providing a sermon on Pentecost, the 50th day after, after Jesus is crucified and rises, he ascends into heaven, the great commission. On the 50th day, his Holy Spirit is poured out to a great crowd a great crowd of 3,000 or more. Um, and it is in this context that Peter is explaining to everyone there what has just happened because some of them are saying, what, what does this mean? What, what, what just happened? And others are saying, well, they've just had new wine. They're drunk, right? Peter says, no, no, they're not drunk. This is exactly what the prophet Joel told us would happen. He will pour his spirit out upon you. And this is what is happening. Jesus Christ was not just a prophet. He was not another prophet. In fact, Peter says, he's not David. I can take you to David's grave. He's dead. He's dead in the ground. Jesus Christ has arisen. He has gone. He has returned to heaven with God. And God, he is God's son. And out his spirit upon you and the people that are persuaded by what Peter says say then what shall we do what is it that we need to do given this because Peter has actually just told them you are the ones who crucified Christ your sins Christ died for your sins and you crucified him and they say then what should we do what is it that we're to do and he tells them in Acts 38 which is the verse for our verse today. And he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that's Acts 3, 2, 38. And our verse 239 is him clarifying that. What he's clarifying, what I've given you is the context for adult baptism and why it is that we engage in adult baptism. Just as in Acts, we are the church, and the church is ever-growing, and it grows in part by adults professing their faith, by having a personal conversion, experience with God, they're confessing their faith, 
baptism, adult baptism, is a way for them to publicly profess their faith, for us to accept them into the church and bring them into the church. Well, what about their children? Because as the church goes on and grows, people will have children. People who are already baptized will have children. And so what about their children? And so Peter tells us in the next verse, his promise is for you and for your children and all of them that come after. And so in Acts 38, 39, we sort of have two sides of the same coin. The coin is the covenant. It is the covenant, it is the agreement between God and his people. And on one side of the covenant is adult baptism. And on the other side of the covenant is infant baptism. And it is the way in which the church is meant to grow. And when Peter says, for his promise is for you and for your children, he is alluding back to Genesis 17 where God says to Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumscribed, circumcised. I knew I was gonna do that. Um, it, it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And so God is saying to Abraham, you are my people, you and your children, and all who follow are part of it. And as a sign, you will not circumscribe, but circumcise your children. Now, there's women here, so you're wondering, hey, what about us? This doesn't seem fair, right? Um, and I'll get to that. So, what Peter is 39 is he's circumcised sign of the covenant in the Old Testament. God had many covenants. He had covenants with Adam, the tree of life, Noah, the rainbow, and for Adam, he gave him circumcision. But you, you no longer need to be circum circumcised. Peter tells, Paul tells us in Colossians, you were circumcised through Christ. Your old nature was cut off with a circumcision made without hands. Christ was crucified for you. You were buried with him in baptism. You were raised with him through faith. And so you have baptism. You don't need You have baptism. And so in circumcision, the sign of the old covenant, blood needed to be shed. And it pointed forward to the cross, to the coming of Jesus Christ, who would shed his blood for you. And baptism points back and says the blood has been shed. Your sins have been forgiven. They have been washed away. And you will be baptized as evidence of your faith. And just like in the Old Testament, where God has told Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. In the same way, the new covenant is for you and for your children and all who come after them. And this is how it plays out throughout Acts. As the disciples go throughout and they, they worship, they tell people about the life of Christ, the love of God, the grace of God, Every time someone is converted, he and his family are baptized. Cornelius converts, and he and his family are baptized. There's the conversion of the Philippian jailer when Paul and Silas are in jail, and they're singing hymns, and all of a sudden there's an earthquake, and the, the doors of the jail open up, and the, the uh, what is it that keeps your hands together? Those are freed. They're freed, the slaves are freed, Paul is freed, the, the guard is knocked out. What's up? He's... He thinks that Paul has escaped from the prison. And Paul says, no, we're here, don't worry. 
And the guard, who's amazed, says, what shall I do? What do I need to do to be saved? And Paul tells him that, what does he tell him? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And he, the, the jailer, was baptized. He and all his family were baptized. So when a believer is baptized, so are all his family. And family and household is a very expansive word. It must include infants. And so we see that practice here today in our Presbyterian faith, right? There's another conversion, the conversion of Lydia. Lydia is even a better example. Going back to my earlier Paul was preaching, and the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying. And she was baptized. Her and all of her family were baptized. So again and again. And here we see evidence of God's ever-expanding grace throughout this process of the covenant. The covenant is growing. It's not only for men and for women, for Jews and for Gentiles, but it's also for adults and infants. His promise is for you and for your children and all who come after them. And so the question really isn't, where does it say in the New Testament that we should baptize infants? The question is, where in the New Testament does it say that we should stop conveying the sign of the covenant to our children? Because we should, and we do. And that is why we baptize in the Presbyterian faith. Because his promise, the covenant, is for you and for your children and for all who God calls to him. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice, your son, and above all, your full grace and openness to our faith, to letting us grow in your sight and having us grow as a family and take on new members, not only through baptism, but infant baptism as well. We thank you for everything that you have done for us. And now we will say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I'm sorry. Yes, that's correct. Sorry. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.